It turned and left us alone for a few seconds, crushing foam and wood underfoot as it turned into an alley and disappeared. Feeling safe for a moment, I tore off a long piece of my plain undershirt and wrapped it around my leg to cover my nasty injury. As I did so, I realized that there weren't actually any books or shelves in the place, only wallpaper with pictures of bookshelves. After seeing the hunter knock down a street light, I was worried that it would do the same to one outside the store, which produced a glow that removed escape through the windows as an option. If that pole came crashing into the store, we were probably done for, so I didn't want to stick around. Even though the pain in my leg was starting to get to me, I stood back up, felt the nearby wall, and with no better ideas, began to ram myself into it, shoulder first. The wood had some give to it, so I was hoping I'd eventually break through it, or at least dislodge the nails keeping it in place. It's not a good idea. Noise attracts its attention. So you have seen that thing before, I said as I kept at it. Just once. And that's why I was so concerned about the lights. It would be out of here by now and safe if it wasn't for those two. Sure, I told him. And now that he had sufficiently pissed me off, I added, For all I know, you might have been luring people here to feed that thing. Bars, come on. Jack tried to calm me down. There's no point in trying to rile anyone up. Survival comes first. Should I help with that? I didn't say no, so Jack got up and added his weight to the wrecking ball, hitting in sync with myself. Once again, Laszlo didn't look ready to help at all. Hey, why don't you make yourself useful and get that guy's backpack? I asked him after several minutes. Maybe there's something we could use, like a weapon, if we're really lucky. Of course, he was reluctant to do so, but I insisted until he eventually got down on his knees and quietly crawled against the part of the wall that was still intact. Once he reached the exposed portion in the debris pile, he peeked into the alley, took a deep breath, and reached out to pull out the dust-covered backpack. He tossed it at us and scrambled back into the shadow before the predator could take notice of him. Me and Jack got in a few more bashes before checking out the backpack. The wall was starting to bend outward, but we'd need a break before smashing through. All right, Jack said, his fingers on the backpack zipper. If we were in a movie, there'd be something in the bag that would help us get out of here. Too bad we were only stuck in a real-world survival situation, and only some German energy bars and water bottles were inside, along with a few useless brochures on local spots. Those two seemed underprepared for explorers. Any sort of metal tool would have been useful to the wall. A crowbar would have been perfect, but I'd have settled for a piece of climbing gear or something. Still, we weren't going to waste what we did have, so we slumped down onto the floor again, began unwrapping the bars and unscrewing the bottle tops. Laszlo, seriously, how long have you known about that thing? Jack asked in a demanding voice. Our guide shook his head and still looked reluctant to tell us. After a few bites of food, he gave in and answered. My father worked in this place. He didn't keep any notes about what happened here or even tell me about anything. He never came home shortly before they closed it. He disappeared. We weren't told why. I suddenly felt a little less indignant towards him. Just like the guy who sold me the engines back in the States. He had a dad that worked for these people, or at least their Soviet counterparts. And you started sneaking in here to look for him? When I was 10 or 11, yes, the first time. It was right after the Russian military pulled out of the area, and only defense and cameras were left to guard the place. My older brother and one of his friends who had been here once before snuck me in with them late at night. He hadn't found our father, but was already doing what I've been for years. You know, scavenging. My stupid young mind thought I could find our dad here, if I could just look around. I think my brother only agreed to bring me so I could find some sort of closure. So what happened? Laszlo sighed, and after a little while, they turned the lights on. They were walking ahead of me down the street, while I was looking at all these strange buildings, made in the style of a country I knew little about. My brother, he turns around and tells me to catch up. And the next thing I see, he is taken away by a shadow, moving so fast I can barely see it. 
His friend let out a scream and ran in the wrong direction towards the other lights. I never saw what happened to him. I just stood there, lost track of time, waiting for them to come back. Until I eventually left on my own. My mother demanded to know what happened, and even today, I still don't know what to tell her. I almost buried that whole night into the back of my mind like I pretended it wasn't real. I'm sorry that happened to you, I told him. I realized that such trauma could explain why he had been freezing up. But when did you come back? Not until I was in my twenties, and had heard all the rumors about the lights in the place from other explorers. Like I said, my brother was trying to help and give me closure. But I didn't really find any until I returned, to try and end the nightmares I still had about this place. I never turned the lights on, but exploring every corner at least made me feel like I didn't have to be scared of this giant thing looming just outside the village. I don't get why it hasn't been torn down yet, Jack wondered. Or why it seems so easy to sneak into. Why isn't there any security response? That creature only seems to exist in the light. What if it could run rampant in daylight too? It does seem to be contained here. Our country's other sarcophagus, Laszlo muttered. We finished our food and water, and it was obvious to the others that I had something on my mind, now that I had a moment to think about this place. I was in this country not too long ago. Right around the time Russia was invading Crimea, I, I knew it was a bad idea, but my uncle... You don't have to, Jack said, but I cut him off. It's fine. I can talk about it. Being here sort of, I don't know, makes it relevant. See, he had survived cancer three times before. It was too much for him the last time. He was a tough old bastard in the best of ways. Lived in a town not too far from the conflict. Thought I was risking my life just to say goodbye to him. I tapped my dosimeter and continued, trying to keep it brief. His stories always fascinated me as a kid. They taught me about technology, power, and, yeah, radiation. I was a nerd when I was young because of him. Still am, in some ways. Your uncle. Did he work at... I shook my head. He didn't work there, but he was brought in as a liquidator and shoveled irradiated rubble off the reactor. I was claimed he tossed a giant piece of granite all by himself. Increased the size of it every time he told me the tale. It cost him, though. Did a number on his DNA. I still remember when that happened. Our village was evacuated, but we were allowed to go back eventually. Your uncle was among heroes. Do you think the machine is nuclear-powered? Jack wondered. And that it's leaking? Suppose it's possible. Doesn't explain the dust and the lights, though. And what about you? Laszlo tiredly asked Jack. You got a story? Jack shrugged after staring off into space for a few seconds. He answered. There's uh, something I can't stop thinking about. It's not an obsession, more like a calling that feels like a mental infection. I got a wife and kid back home, and I don't know how good a dad I can be until I at least try to deal with my personal issues. I hadn't realized that he felt that way. Since I could never really get a word out of him, his reasons for wanting to come to the Ukraine. Of course, Laszlo knew even less about what he might have been feeling. You two aren't like the others I've brought here. You don't seem like tourists. Were you always just looking for something in this place? I hesitated to bring someone else into our strange web of stories and secret Cold War projects. But I figured if there was anything left that he hadn't told us, doing so might spark some forgotten memory of his journeys into this place, or highlight some menial detail that he thought wasn't important. So, I gave him a brief, abridged version of the events and mysteries we'd collected so far. The deadly toy laser guns, the memory device in Florida, an organic computer once in charge of America's largest nuclear arsenal. 
and a video game rabbit brought to life by a circuit board of murky origin. He listened to every word and was definitely intrigued. Though I don't think he believed everything, which wasn't surprising. He didn't have anything new to say about the fake town, the lights, or the machine, but he did have one small theory about Jack. Let's all say that this is real, and that this thing in Florida did something to your mind. Maybe it did leave some sort of virus, you know, or reprogrammed your brain. Put thoughts in your head you can't let go of. Could be the same way with this friend of yours who's still sleeping in a hospital. Jack rubbed his forehead and mumbled. Yeah, maybe. Hey, is there any chance we could just wait out the lights? Maybe it's a generator that'll run out of fuel eventually? Laszlo shot that down. There are high voltage power lines that keep this place running several kilometers from the village. They go underground the rest of the way. I have never been able to find who pays for all this, but like I said before, I have never seen an actual security response. It only has cameras. Alright, so it's back to getting out on our own. I started bashing myself against the wall again. Jack rejoined me, and after several minutes, even Laszlo worked up the nerve to help. With the three of us, it didn't take long until nails popped out. The section of the wall had collapsed and we could see the next alleyway on our other side. But it was bad news for us. The building opposite the bookstore, a bank, was made of actual brick, with no way to climb up to the roof. There were no windows to break through and no hopes of tearing a hole in such a wall. To our left was the outer edge of one of those dangerous lights, but we'd be able to narrowly avoid touching it if we slid up against the brick wall. The buildings on the other side of the street looked more promising. Alongside a small hotel where fire escape stairs would be able to easily use to get to the top of the second story roof. From there, if we could just jump across another five buildings, we'd be back at the cinema and basically home free. The only problem was that the alleyways on our side of the street were different to the ones on the other side. To get to the fire escape, we'd have to run right through the widest part of one of the spheres. But I beat running down the street and through half a dozen glowing death traps. The plan worked out, we hugged the brick wall and headed single file towards the road. The light's hard edge was only inches away from us as we moved. Just as I got to the halfway point in the alley, where the light curvature came within millimeters of my chest, I had to hold my breath and suck in my gut just to avoid it. Our pursuer leapt down from the roof and made impact just by the bookstore wall. We froze in place as it paced back and forth, studying us and waiting for any of us to enter the light, even just slightly. I was running out of good air and wanted to keep moving, but Laszlo on my right was frozen stiff. After a moment, Jack, to my left, had some sort of nervous twitch, and a few of his fingers went into the light. The metal beast's reaction time was insanely fast, and it twisted its body around and slashed at his hand in less than a second. Jack only barely pulled his fingers back in time to keep from losing anything and the sharp claws vanished as they swiped into the darkness. I used the momentary distraction to move Laszlo away, and out, over onto the sidewalk, then sidestep away to safety where I could gulp in some air. Jack stood there for a few seconds more, staring into the two red lights and unwilling to move. The machine soon lost interest, then turned and walked out of the light. He took a deep breath and, carefully, slid against the wall and joined us out in the middle of the street. It didn't feel quite safe out there, even though the lights ahead and behind us were a good distance away. We knew that thing was stalking us. It could probably hear, see, or maybe even smell us, even when it wasn't sharing the space with us. The thought of it somehow looking right at us from somewhere else, while we were out in the open, only added to my anxiety. There was every chance it could lunge out from the shadows and attack any of us the moment we touched the light. This was the tough part. To get to that fire escape, we'd have to run through a light. I estimated that we'd be exposed to it for maybe about a second and a half. If we got some space to work up to a full sprint, maybe we could take that down to a second. Problem was, a nail was just in my leg, and my limp was going to slow me down. 
And though I didn't like thinking about it, I knew we couldn't go in one at a time, if that thing means to pick us off. If all three of us stayed together, then at worst, maybe only one of us would be in trouble. We agreed on the plan, and backed up as much as we could to get a better running start. It was such a small space to cross. We'd make it, I told myself. I had to tell myself that, or I'd never work up the nerve to try. We breathed out. We breathed in and held it, and being careful not to bump into each other, took off our feet hitting the asphalt hard. I didn't know what to expect when we went into the light knowingly this time. Looking back, I remember feeling that tingle on my skin and seeing desaturated color from inside the light, and the sound of a thick layer of dust crunching under my feet, almost like snow. The very atmosphere in the light also felt different as if reality itself had been muffled in some sort of way. It was like I had crossed the vacuum of space for a brief moment in time. I made it through first, despite my injury, and nearly ran into a wall as I slowed down. Jack crossed the chasm just behind me, and I had enough time to turn around and watch Laszlo pass through as well. He was almost there. So close that I could see the strain and fear in his eyes as he went through the same light that cost him his brother years ago. But then the machine burst from the shadow, its jaws already open. Most of Laszlo got through the light and to safety, but not his left arm. The beast crunched down onto his hand and pulled him away back into the light. Jack reacted in time, managing to grab Laszlo's right hand in an attempt to save him. Of course, we were like rabbits to a wolf against such a machine, and Jack was easily dragged into light right with Boris. I grabbed onto Jack, then worked my way up to Laszlo's free arm. With our combined strength, we slowed the beast's efforts to take him away, just long enough to make the difference. The creature responded by yanking harder, and I heard something let out a sickening snap. We fell backwards onto the alleyway with Laszlo, and the beast took off with blood on its jaws, and something in its teeth. Once we had a chance to recover and realize that we were still alive, I checked Laszlo's injuries. It quickly became obvious why he was wailing in so much pain. His left arm, from the elbow down, was gone. With his sleeve ripped to shreds, it was worse than I expected, and if we couldn't stop the bleeding, I knew he wouldn't survive. No, we really had a time limit to get out of here. Boris, I have a bit of medical training, Jack told me. Let me help him. There's no point in both of us trying to reach the control room. I was used to living a solitary life, but right now, being alone was the last thing I wanted. Are you sure? I asked Jack. If I don't make it, you are both screwed too. I might be able to keep him from bleeding out. Boris, go get these lights off. I nodded, knowing that he was right. I turned to leave, but Laszlo grabbed my arm. He looked desperate to pass on a message. It was hard to tell how coherent he was at the time, considering the pain he must have felt. Control room. Not real. He muttered before letting go and passing out. I didn't actually really even absorb what he had told me. With his life on the line, I pulled myself up onto the fire escape and onto the roof. I looked at the buildings and the lights ahead of me. The cinema and my exit were so close. There was just a little bit of space left to cover, as ominous as that space felt. There was something lurking out there that I couldn't see, hunting me diligently. I would never be able to outrun it, but as long as I avoided the lights, I had a chance. I took a deep breath, studied the distance to my next building, and made a running leap across the alley. As I jumped, I looked at the light to my right. He was just standing there, in the middle of the glowing sphere, watching me as I briefly flew in the air, its eyes and head tracking my movement. I landed on the roof of a townhouse, but didn't give myself any time to recover before sprinting to the next building. I jumped without giving it much thought, and again saw the machine glaring at me from the next line, in the same exact pose from before. I landed on the next townhouse hard, with aching legs and feet. Still, I was surprising myself tonight. I almost felt like I could take up parkour. 
I made it across the next building and then the next. I still couldn't believe it. I looked like I would make it. The adrenaline pumping through me pretty much let me shrug off the injury caused by the nail. But I got a little ahead of myself, or overconfident. The last building on this side of the street was the 80s arcade, and unlike most every other structure, it only had a single floor. I screwed up my landing, crashing hard onto its roof and rolled around in pain for a few moments. It didn't feel like I'd broken anything. A twisted or sprained ankle probably, but no breakage. It cost me, and Laszlo, precious time. But I stood up as soon as I could and put some weight on my right leg. It hurt, but it was bearable. I dropped onto the dumpster on the side of the building and hit the street. I was past all the lights. The machine stood in the glow of the nearest street lamp glaring at me without emotion. It had no way of getting to me anymore. I worked up the confidence to flick it off before heading towards the exit. It didn't react to that either. I found the bulkhead-like door by the cinema left open by the two hapless tourists, and went on through. Just to be extra safe, I closed the door behind me, but made sure it didn't lock in any way so I wouldn't trap Laz and Jack in. I stepped back into the long, quiet, and almost empty warehouse, which felt like a different world on the opposite side of the time capsule. It seemed brighter than I had remembered, but, of course, my eyes had adjusted to the darkness of the town, with my right leg practically dragging across the floor by this point, I moved forward, my destination somewhere on the opposite side of the entire structure. I felt a tingling on my skin as I walked. I ignored it, at first, and went a little further. Then it hit me. I had felt that sensation twice already. I looked up. When we went through here before, every other fluorescent light on the ceiling was on. Now they all were. For some inexplicable reason, or as another twisted part of whatever experiment all of this was supposed to be, these new lights put out the same glow as the street lamps. They even sounded the same as normal fluorescence, adding their electrical buzz to the collective hum that filled the lengthy hallway. Their glow filled every space among the empty shelves, all the way down to the concrete below. There was no way to avoid them. My dosimeter was going nuts. With the lights on, the utilitarian Cold War era corridor must have been full of that radioactive dust. For all I knew, it could have been floating around the air as well. Breathing any of it in could be a death sentence given enough time. So I did what I could to mitigate things by taking off my outer long sleeve shirt, wrapping it around my mouth and nose, and taking in a deep breath as long as I could. The Germans came through here and made it to the town, I told myself. The door is closed. You're fine. You'll make it. It was a long hallway, ominously empty, filled with the light and the sound of electrical humming. Strange how such a place could instill so much fear. Maybe it was the banality of the contrast to the monster still stalking us. The good air in my lungs wouldn't stick around for so long. So I started walking as fast as I could with a bum leg. The damn fluorescent buzzing was already pissing me off by the time I was halfway down the hall, going past one empty metal shelf after the next. As I was looking up at the emergency lights and wondering if they could produce the weird glow as well, I heard the worst sound possible, which was anything at all, really. Somewhere behind me, some piece of metal equipment hit the floor, with its clanking echoing throughout the hallway. I froze in place, but I knew I had to turn around. I did so, and at first I didn't see anything. I walked backwards a few feet, waiting for something to appear. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me when I first saw it, like I was having some sort of paranoid delusion after being hunted, maybe just a hundred feet away. Metal claws were protruding from the wall itself, just simply coming right out of the cinder blocks of the town's containment barrier. A leg emerged, and then another, and then the creature's head. There was no sort of 
blending element between its body and the wall as it phased straight through it. No Hollywood special effect glow, no distortion of space, no damage done to the wall itself. Just the atoms of one material seemingly giving way to another. I'd seen some of the most bizarre things in my life tonight, but the latest sight topped everything else so far. Once both of its front legs were out, the machine leapt out and hit the warehouse floor, sending tremors throughout the building and rattling the shelves. It turned and stared me down. I very clearly remember exhaling and wasting some of the breath to blurt out an appropriate response. You've gotta be shitting me.